the sea ahead appears interminable. You realize the full significance of the task before you. To be subject to every puff of wind and every squall that blows, day after day, month after month. To have to work by the strength of your own hands a full-rigged ship, dependent upon her sails alone for motion. From England to the Cape of Good Hope, Australia or New Zealand, around Cape Horn and back home to England. The most demanding sea voyage known to man. Those are the words of Alan Villiers, a most remarkable man whom I'm very proud to have known. He was a fine writer, a great seafarer, and a man who knew just about all there was to be known about sailing full-rigged ships. Earlier this century, he'd actually served as a working member of the crew on board ships very much like this one. <coughs> These sailing barks, and I'm standing now on the deck of one of the most famous of them, the Cutty Sark, were built for massive strength, massive, but they were also built for speed because their main objective, once they loaded up with their cargo of uh, grain, tea, wool, whatever it was, was to drive, to go like the clappers across the oceans, round Cape Horn and Cape of Good Hope, and get back to their home port as quick as they could. Because the sooner the passage was made, the bigger the margin of profit for the owner and for the skipper and the crew, well, uh, added prestige and maybe a bonus. So, in essence, it was a race, often a very hazardous one. The men who sailed these great square riggers had tenacity, courage, and huge skill. Well, they're, they're pretty well all gone. But they still throw out a challenge to the sailors of this generation, the ocean yachtsmen of today. And in the early 70s, a race was devised that would follow almost exactly the route of the old square riggers. A hard race a dramatic race, a genuine round-the-world race, known as the Whitbread. around the world sail into Portsmouth, England for the start of the 1985-86 Whitbread. Yachts of different nationality, capacity and design. From the ultimate maxi racing yachts like New Zealand's NZI Enterprise of up to 80 feet and over, designed specifically to win the race outright, to the smallest boat in the race, like Denmark's SAS Bayer Viking of little more than 50 feet, there for the honor of participating, but with little hope of outright victory. This race, organized by the Royal Naval Sailing Association, offers no pot of gold to the winner. It's one sports event where the Olympic ideal of competing honorably still holds true. You're sailing on the kind of the edge of disaster, and one false move and it spells trouble. You either break a gear or you, you injure someone. Uh, and especially for for from my standpoint as skipper, it's always a, I have to have a little bit of a tempering influence on the crew. You know, when they really go for it, you have to say sometimes pull back a bit. It's not worth carrying a chute now. Let's carry a headsail or or this type of thing. Um, and, and it's I think for everybody it's a bit nervous. But I mean that's 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 why we're here. We're not here to play the safe. Uh, we're here to take calculated risks, and that's what it's all about in the Whitbread race. You're competing with your peers. You're, you're in the middle of an exciting situation which can't be repeated, can't be equal by any other kind of ocean race. So, I mean, the ambience is something which um, is absolutely electric at times. They are quite large yachts by anyone's standard. In maybe 20, 30 foot sea with some of the tops breaking, and you actually start surfing at high speed uh, down the fronts of these waves, um, of course, there's no one around at all, just you there, no one to, no one to watch you doing it. And it goes on for hour after hour. And it's fun for a while, and then it 
the guys down below can't sleep because of the roar going past the ice and they can feel it nearly out of control and the adrenaline's pumping all the time and you know, after a day of that you're actually quite thankful that it, it eases off. We are the first Danish boat to be in the race and we believe that's important and uh, we are doing it on a very low budget and it's good to prove that people can still do that even though the others are so expensive. For me it's not only sailing, it's also uh, organization, uh, pr preparation of uh, the operation. We have been boat in Switzerland. Uh, it's not only the race. I think the uh, search race is winning before the start. You never dry for four or five weeks, so it's going to be pretty tough. You can't wash, there's no washing facilities. Um, salt water wash, maybe. But, um, it's pretty crude. The guys on the boat have been really, really good. They're, they're very, very nice guys. A uh, few of them had a little bit of reserve about having a girl on the boat, I and mean, even though they're friends, um, but they put up with it gallantly. It's a challenge to finish the race with my own crew, and it's all friends of me, and come back with my own crew. What else is there? Uh, I, I don't think you'd find anyone that would dispute that the Whitbread race is the, the greatest offshore race there is. As this race happens every four years, inevitably, like a war, you're planning the next war on the evidence of the last one. And because these boats are so big and take so long to build and work up, we've actually got to set the rules the day after the previous race finishes. Some people have said, you know, only 15 boats, good heavens, is it worth it? Well, it's not a question of 15 boats. We've got over 250 yachtsmen taking part and they all consider that this is the ultimate, the Everest of sailing and looking back in time, the first race they were all very glad to get round in the second race there were perhaps two boats competing last race there were maybe half a dozen this race I, would, I think there are perhaps only two boats that are not there totally to win are to clear the line between HMS Glasgow and TS Royland and the area to the east of that line to allow the start to take place. jokingly said yesterday that I thought there'd be about 10,000 boats on the Solent. There, there are. Are and there? You think? And they're right the whole way from here down to the Needle. Solid.
60 crew members, 15 yachts, each carrying a handicap depending on hull size and sail capacity. It'll be as long as eight months before some of the yachts see English waters again. navigate the world, to sail right round the globe. For centuries that's been man's dream. There have been milestones towards its realization. The great seafarers, Diaz, Vasco da Gama, Magellan, right up to Drake and Cork, each one of them by their astonishing, courageous voyages, took the art of navigation a giant step forward. Today, the seas of the world are accurately charted, and navigational equipment is highly sophisticated. But the unknown patterns of the ocean and the weather are still as unpredictable as ever. In that respect, nothing has changed from when the skipper of this ship, the Cutty Sark, used to chart his course from this cabin to the skippers of the 15 yachts in the Whitbread fleet. A course still has to be charted, regardless. The Whitbread race is divided into four stages. First stage, from Portsmouth, across the Bay of Biscay, down through the doldrums, west coast of Africa, to Cape Town. Second stage, across the Southern Ocean to Auckland, New Zealand. Third stage, from Auckland, New Zealand, round the notorious Cape Horn, up north, to Punta del Este in Uruguay. And finally, across the South Atlantic, up north, up, 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 way back home to Portsmouth. 27,000 miles, and some of the toughest sailing known to man. Cut off your report tomorrow. You may wish to include that um, on North Starty yesterday we had some problems on the foredeck. We had one wave sweep over the foredeck and carry the foredeck boss uh, over the side of the boat together with uh, one of our sails and some of our stanchions. The man was recovered okay, no problems. The man was recovered, he was still clipped on. I'm yanking on the head, I one hand, I got the hook, and the other hand trying to re hook it. What I wanted to do. I was going to start this post mortem by saying that it was only a matter of time before this watch lost either a life or the mark. It's asking a lot from people who work normal, what we might call normal lives to adjust to working four hours on and four hours off, day and night, and being called on their four hours off to assist with other tasks and with the motion and the different food. It's very different, but uh, we are starting to work together. We're starting to get used to it. Happy birthday to problem areas and uh, we go to the mast each day. Uh, not a very pleasant job but it has to be done. We went up three days ago and found that the forestay, which is a, a piece of very solid wire rope, it's a 19 strand wire rope, 
and some of the strands have started to break at the masthead, and we don't know just how, how serious the damage is there. The first leg to Cape Town sees the less experienced crews finding their feet, none more so than the crew of the oldest boat in the race, Norsk Data GB, most of whom have paid several thousand pounds for the privilege of joining up. I ended up talking to two of the crew on North Data. They told me that there was a free place going and if I could scrape together the money, you know, I should come along. So I went away and thought about it and Friday morning I came down to the dock in Gosport and I just decided that it was too good an opportunity to pass off, so here I am. I'm accepted as just one of the team, and just because I'm a girl it doesn't matter. I can't do the physical work like winching up sails, but I do sail trimming just like anybody else, and I think I get treated just the same. Over the first few days, what tends to happen is that when people aren't used to being at sea, they do get seasickness. It was quite a problem with a couple of the lads, actually. They had to keep pushing fluids down them all the time, water to stop them rehydrating, also giving them anti-seasickness tablets. to sleep here. I don't know what you expect. But the six of us living in this small area here. We can try and be a little bit more careful, I suppose. You smell like matter. everyone else does. Nothing. You're no different you just because you're bag. in the Cali. You my bag. I change every two days. I, I clean with the toilet paper. So that's why you're smelling. No. Just had some breakfast. So we get four hours off before we start again. Have a quick wash. These wipes. Get this sunblock off. Try and get some dirt out of my face. I've never had so many spots in my life as I have on this trip because we can't wash with fresh water, it's just seawater or wipes all the time. Dry my hair off a bit. <laughs> and get into a nice damp bunk because the hatch leaks. So uh, sheets are never dry. But um, it's just something you have to put up with. It's all part of ocean sailing and everybody else is in the same position as I am, which makes it a lot easier. Roll on Cape Town and fresh water shower. The 7,010 mile first leg from Portsmouth to Cape Town was proving uneventful to the fleet. The doldrums, often decisive on this leg, were hardly a factor. The yacht barely slowed in their haste to get into the southeast trades. Everything looked relatively trouble-free. Then, off the southwest coast of Africa, the South Atlantic High spun gale-force southeasterly winds into the leader's path, producing an evil, short and steep sea, which meant heavy punishment for those of the fleet to get caught.
UBS Switzerland, one of the lightest of the A-class maxi yachts, was fortunate and lost no more than a mainsail in the storm. She was the first to complete the 7,010-mile journey into Cape Town in the record time of 37 days, one hour and 39 minutes, over two days quicker than the previous record set by Flyer in the 1981-82 race. While Pierre Feilman and his crew celebrate a sweet victory, others are fighting to survive. While leading the race, Atlantic privateer lost her mast in the storm, managed to rig a temporary replacement, but that also broke. Eventually, privateer was forced to take on board fuel off a passing tanker and had to enter her home port of Cape Town under engine power, and as a result, faced disqualification over the first leg of the race. Effectively, Privateer's race for outright line honours was over, but she would bravely decide to continue the race and would shine again. It is L'Esprit d'Equipe, one of the smallest yachts in the race, with its nine-man French crew, which heads into Cape Town as race leader on handicap after the first leg. And although several days behind the leaders, Bob Salmon and the crew of Norsk Data GB quietly slip into Cape Town at night, beating the record set by their boat in the three previous Whitbread races by 14 hours. Having taken a well-earned rest and undertaken necessary repairs after the first leg, from replacing shattered masts and sails to repairing damaged hulls and rigging, the fleet make final preparations for the second leg, the journey to Auckland. The emotional farewells for another month at sea, as last supplies and equipment go on board. The fleet gets ready to move out. second leg of the Whitbread, 7,101 miles from Cape Town to Auckland, entails crossing that vast expanse of water known as the Southern Ocean. The Southern Ocean in winter can be cruel. Experienced hands from the earliest days of ocean sailing to the current Whitbread fleet all talk about the possibility of heavy running in the roaring forties, extreme cold and hidden ice. They respect this stretch of water as much as any other. On this second leg, there's an expanse of sea where the warmer southern Indian Ocean meets the colder waters of the Antarctic. This is known as the Antarctic Convergence. The prevailing westerly winds with long, steady seas travel unhindered. And the crews of the larger maxi racers hoist the appropriate sails and ride out these downward flyers, sometimes day after day in a never-ending roller coaster ride. While the 80-foot super maxis with their high-tech specifications and million-dollar budgets power ahead, competing only for outright honors, the smallest boat in the race the 50-foot SAS Bayer Viking, under her skipper and builder, Jasper Norsk, are racing only against themselves. Their sole wish is to complete the race. I've been sailing all my life, and I've always dreamt of building a boat. 
and I was very much inspired by a trip to the Caribbean seven years ago and the basic principles in this boat were formed at that time. A yacht, it must be very strongly built and that's partly why I chose steel as a building material. Down below, it's our home and we have a good galley. On this race, we have to feed 10 people all the time, so it's important that they have good facilities for that. In boats, production boats this size, you usually have a lot of cabins and toilets crammed together. But we like it more spacey, so you have a more a feeling of room. We believe it's very important that the people will be motivated to go as fast as they can all the time. On the second leg, the notorious forties never roared. The fleet saw no icebergs, hardly any snow, and instead of days of heavy running, a persistent northeast wind dominated the majority of the 7,101 miles. The roller coaster rides of the previous Whitbreads were far fewer. It was constant reaching under grey skies. This was hardly the stuff of which Southern Ocean legends are made, but the experienced racers were not complaining. From the moment the fleet left Cape Town, it was a tightly fought race between NZI Enterprise and Atlantic Privateer, and would stay that way to New Zealand. The two Bruce Farr designed maxis being less than a thousand meters apart right into Auckland after 29 days of sailing. Around Tamaki Drive is just jammed as people have thrown down from the eastern suburbs all over Auckland. The sea of Atlantic Privateer, there goes the gun and there's a tremendous roar. Horns going off across the Waitamata Harbour and Atlantic Privateer has taken the gun for line honours in the second leg of the fourth footbread and follows in the tradition of Condor 1977 and Flyer in 1981. But Atlantic Privateer has taken nearly 25 hours off the race record set by Flyer 40 years ago. We've been match racing for days. I mean, for about seven days we've been in sight. Climb up the mast and uh, look around and there it is. Fly high! It's an eye enterprise. That's the sky. It's an eye enterprise. You're down on the surprise. So leave them all behind and say bye-bye. great to come in with a with a close finish and uh, really racing all the way it was uh, a tremendous experience and the welcome of course when we came in and uh, the public enthusiasm and all the rest of it uh, I mean it wasn't well it got to everyone on the boat I mean there wasn't one one guy that didn't have tears running down his face it was uh, very emotional for us for Auckland much excitement was caused by the closeness of the two hometown entries NZI and Lion Lion beat NZI in the first leg by around 15 hours, while NZI is ahead of Lion in the second leg by precisely the same time. As Lion enters Auckland, minutes separate the two yachts on overall elapsed time. 300 meters to go to take uh, fifth place. Uh, they will be around 15 hours behind Atlantic Privateer, but they're getting a tremendous Heroes hometown welcome, and there is a crew member out on the spinnaker boom. They seem to have some difficulty there. He will be right over the water at the moment. He must be about 10 feet off the deck. And now he's coming back down the stay marvellous up to the bow. And they have been really sailing under some difficulty. They've uh, blown out three or four spinnakers coming down the Northland coast. And Lion New Zealand has missed the deadline of 4.31 to beat NZA Enterprise on overall elapsed time for the two legs halfway round the world. But there will only be a couple of minutes in it. Here's the launch with, come on, come on, there goes the gun. And the arms go up. And Lion New Zealand is home to a great welcome. They've got this, and they'll just be a couple of minutes behind NZI Enterprise. So the two New Zealand boats so close halfway round the world, 29 hours behind the overall leader, UBS Switzerland. Here's to the lad, the boys in red, the Lion New Zealand crew. 
It's another round in the Whitbread, boys. You know, the race we're gonna win. You've got to leave where you belong. You gotta make that big boat fly. But when you're on the wind or running free, you're gonna hear this Kiwi cry. Run out, boys! Don't consider the race as won or lost until we cross the finish line or the opposition cross the finish line in England. I mean, one could get run down by a freighter in the Channel or uh, run into a, a broken loose container. They're things that don't happen very often. We generally hit a whale every race, but they don't get stuck under between the rudder and the keel. But you can't insure against that sort of thing. I don't think it's just one of the things that happen. You've got to put up with it and say, well, that's just tough luck. If that's cost us the race, well, so be it. That's yachting. The whole, the whole run has been given a real smash. Luck we've got it at all. Although for New Zealand there were really only two boats in the race, Lion and NZI, the yacht which was to lead on overall handicap at the halfway stage was Dutch entry, Philips Innovator. It's a tribute to Auckland that even the last boat in the fleet to arrive, SAS Baya, a full 10 days behind the leaders would receive the same city of sales welcome. Bayer was virtually self-sufficient and only entered port because the race regulations called for it. She's one of the few entries that could probably have circumnavigated the world without stopping off at all. The third leg of the Whitbread 6,255 miles from Auckland, New Zealand to the port of Punta del Este in Uruguay is for many the most exciting leg of the race. It involves rounding Cape Horn, the southernmost tip of the Americas, patrolling the meeting point of two vast oceans. Since man first circumnavigated the world, the horn has held a particular mystique, a particular fascination. It's the one ocean landmark that still conjures up a sense of danger, calling every seafarer, every ocean yachtsman to meet its challenge. So we're up to five, four, the gun to be fired by the Prime Minister of New Zealand. <laughs> The cannon echoes around North Head. There's a tremendous cheer from the thousands thronging around the waterfront. And the third leg of the fourth Whitbread Round the World Yacht Race is underway with a squadron of aircraft, helicopters all circling above. The cavalry charge seems to have started and seem to be a whole bunch of people anxious to impair the progress of the boats. Malcolm McKay, how's the view from above? Everybody's nice. Nicely tight reaching on starboard tack as they're going up the Rankin-Soda Channel. Neck and neck, but by New Zealand taking it so far. The Southern Ocean journey from Auckland to Uruguay doesn't offer any real tactical challenge. The principal aim being to stay on the north side of the depressions that circle the bottom of the world and to catch the prevailing airstream. But the weather patterns are so changeable, often vicious, that the crews have to be constantly alert. UBS Switzerland sets the pace for the fleet. Her best 24-hour run being a dazzling 370 miles, averaging over 15 knots of speed. But Cape Horn was still ahead. 
The most experienced skippers in the fleet, I'm sure, feel exactly the same way. You don't know what's going to be down there. We know we're going into ice. We're going into colder conditions than we've experienced up to now. Yeah, apprehensive, and um, we're, <laughs> we're looking forward to getting it behind us. I don't really have any desire to see the Horn again as, uh, as such. I mean, the reason for doing this race was to, was to race a maxi against, uh, against the best maxi skippers in the world and see how we could do against those. And, and uh, uh, seeing icebergs and sailing around the Horn and so on wasn't the reason for doing the race. But I've got to admit that uh, all the same, once we've gone around the Horn, uh, everyone on board, I'm sure, will heave a sigh of relief. It's a turning point and you, you kind of turn the corner and you're out of the Southern Ocean fetch and you kind of sail into the Atlantic and there's a bit of a lee, which doesn't last long, but it's kind of a symbolic little uh, lee and uh, the wind dies and you think, my God, we made it. Really, this is the whole purpose of the project, to, to go around that particular part of land and uh, start going home again. Outset of her design program, Lion New Zealand was built for strength, able to withstand any onslaught of rough weather. But as a result, she's happy, considerably more so than the other purpose-built maxes in the race. Lion also carries a bigger crew, around 22. As a result, she lacks that fine edge of pace, and only really comes into her own when the going gets rough. So, to steal an edge, Lion heads north looking for wind. It doesn't pay off. She lags behind the other leading maxis. But her arch rival, NZI, suffers a far worse fate. We were sailing in moderate airs, I guess, around about 25 knots of wind. We were sailing with the wind forward of the beam. The mast just came tumbling down completely unexpectedly. Pretty close to daybreak, I guess. So it should be around about 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, local time on the yacht. There was some some sail damage done. Uh, both sails ended up, both the mainsail and the blast reacher ended up in the water. It took us, I guess, a couple of hours to get the boat ship shape. Digby Taylor's Whitbread was over, shattered in the Southern Ocean. He never made Cape Horn, and his crew would fly home dispirited. One boat's tragedy does not deter the rest of the fleet's drive forward. The first sighting of icebergs reminds one that we're in desolate waters in 60 degree latitudes. Their eerie white beauty is both reassuring and disturbing. But for SAS Baya, already days behind the leaders, the experience of the Southern Ocean rounding the Horn is a memorable one. The very reason for their venturing into these waters and for us, I guess we got one of the best passes of Cape Horn because we had 45 knots of wind and uh, sunshine and it was fantastic. I know that many of the other boats, they had calms and, and not very nice weather and so on. So. And it was memorable because then you, you come home in the Atlantic, it's like the Atlantic is now your home waters. <laughs> we have a not a very strong wind we passed the horn uh, with uh, light weather and uh, between the horn and here it was a little bit crazy no wind or a uh, very variable wind predictably ubs is the first boat into punta del este covering the 6255 miles from auckland in 24 days and 14 hours uh, yesterday afternoon we have a uh, small hurricane <laughs> that uh, it was uh, I think the only bad weather that we have uh, between uh, New Zealand and here. Second yacht into Punta is Drum England who after her disastrous start to the race suffering from serious hull damage is suddenly coming good. 
After the hard times we had on uh, the first and second leg, didn't do very well in the second leg, and we had some damage on the first leg. On the third leg, we, we did very well. We came second, and we had a, a very good sail. Uh, we sailed tactically very smart, and I think it's because of the, the good tactics and good crew work we came ahead. A good morale booster for us, something we're going to need for the last leg. Simon está tirando la lata de cerveza. Simon, how was the trip? Fantastic. I mean, it was amazing. Um, it's been such a long way. Uh, we've had big waves. We've had little waves. We've had a lot of wind. We've had no wind. We've had whales. We've had dolphins. We've got this amazing crew on board. And um, what about? Did you compose any new song uh, during the trip? No. Ha. Did you? Maybe. Maybe later. But I thank you to everybody in Uruguay for coming to see us in. And make us feel welcome here. This is a fantastic day in my life. Everybody eats the same, they sleep the same, and work the same, and uh, that's the way it's always been planned, and that's how Simon uh, has always wanted it. I mean, he's uh, trying to do the Whitbread experience as a crew member, and that's to do it, you have to do it full on. Overall race leader on handicap after rounding the horn is the 58-foot L'Esprit d'Equipe with her French crew. She overcomes near disaster by nursing a mast that buckled below deck. But L'Esprit manages to hold it together into Punta to keep her in the race. She will now be the yacht to beat on overall handicap for the final leg. The fourth and final leg of the Whitbread, 6,281 miles from Uruguay, smack across the Atlantic, north to Portsmouth, is mostly sailing hard on the wind. The fleet must fetch across two trade wind belts, and the doldrums are almost a relief. This is the leg when boats go as light as possible, stripping out any unwanted weight and, if necessary, reducing the number of crew to give them the best possible chance of a fast time to the finish in England. Del Este, the fleet head north towards the equator, hard on the wind, and pray not to get caught in the doldrums. For those that do, like Ruckenor Tristar, it can be a long wait, losing valuable hours, even days. Glass like seas for as far as the eye can see. Absolutely no wind, just boredom and agonizing frustration. Hitting the doldrums can lose a boat the race. Luck plays its part. When the wind comes, it's a glorious relief. For UBS Switzerland, it's a quick dash across the Atlantic, untroubled by the weather, unaffected by the doldrums, with not a competitor near enough to threaten her lead. Atlantic Privateer takes a gamble and an obscure route. Lion carries too much weight. Drum lacks a meter or two of length. Cote d'Or never finds her potential. UBS enters British waters over half a day ahead of any rival, refreshed, unstrained, and exhilarated. They have shattered the outright record by over two days, set by Flyer in the 1981-82 race.
Covering the four legs of the race in 117 days, 14 hours and 31 minutes, the achievement is a tribute to Pierre Feldman, the lake sailor from Switzerland who has striven to win for the past 11 years. This time he got everything right and nobody could touch him or his meticulous crew. Shortly before midnight, on Monday the 12th of May, L'Esprit d'Equipe, the 58-foot French yacht from the port of St. Malo, slips into Portsmouth to win the final leg from Uruguay on handicap. More important, she takes the overall handicap honours for the race. The victory is particularly sweet because three days earlier, the mast of L'Esprit became distorted, as in the third leg, and it required the astute seamanship of skipper Lionel Payon and his crew to bring the boat home in one piece. For Bayer, the last of the fleet to reach Portsmouth, it is a moment to cherish and a personal triumph for skipper Jasper Norsk. For me, it's been a very long project because all the building of the boat and now the finishing off with the race and so on, actually, I cannot imagine not having done it. But I know that uh, it will be quite different next time because it will be much more competitive with big money involved. I, I think we just got the last call for the amateur business like we did. We've got a second out of it. so. Uh one must be very happy on it. It's not as good as a first, but uh, um, we're ahead of Drum, we're ahead of Cotador, we're ahead of Atlantic Privateer, we're ahead of um, all the other big boats, so uh, why be sorry about that? The first iceberg coming out of the mist when we're doing 15 knots under a spinnaker, it's pretty dramatic. I mean, I've had masts break on me in every other race, and it's cost me the race every time. Um, so every time someone's lost a mast, we've felt it's the best thing ever, because that's what exactly what this race is all about, it's endurance. And the Whitbread race is a, it's a great contrast in life, uh, in a sporting life, and I think to have completed it uh, and having, having it been a success, I think it's a great satisfaction, both uh, physically uh, and emotionally. It's a, it's a combination of all these things, and to, to sit down at the end of the day and put your feet up and say, I've, I, I've done it, it's, uh, it gives me great satisfaction. Her Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales, makes it official. For line honours, the Long John Trophy to Pierre Fellman and the crew of UBS Switzerland. And for winning on overall handicap, the Whitbread Trophy to Lionel Payon and the crew of L'Esprit d'Equipe. The formality is concluded for another four years. The character of the Whitbread has certainly changed since the first race in 1973. As in all classic sports events, winning has become ever more important, stretching the ingenuity of the designer and the courage and skills of the yachtsman. Where once it was enough just to enter and make it through the 27,000 miles, now the challenge is to go all out and win. It's finding that perfect balance between outright pace and strength in both yacht and crew that has made the Whitbread the ultimate ocean race and such a fascinating event to follow. When you think about it, the ideals of today's ocean racer are not so far removed from those of the owners and skippers of the square riggers a century ago.